But uh, so we'll just get right to it. Um, please give a warm clinic USU you welcome all the way from Snow College to Bill King. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought I might start by playing a little bit and then see uh, if there's any questions afterwards and we can kind of take it from there.
curiosity, did anyone recognize that? May not have been what you expected to hear, but uh, no guesses? All right. Uh, any, any of you guys heard of Lewis Cole? Lewis Cole, drummer, keyboardist, singer. Um, he's, uh, he's done a lot of work with the band Nowhere. If you know that name, if you know that band. Um, and he's got a lot of jazz influence in his, in his music. Um, you might also know Jacob Mann, uh, the guy who did the one minute jazz videos. Um, uh, you have to look him up sometime. Uh, but uh, Lewis Cole is a, an amazing musician and I've been really digging a lot of his music recently, but that was a tune from his album called Time and the tune is called When You're Ugly. And it's a really fun, kind of grooving song to listen to. Um, so I tried to, try, I, was, I was listening to it on the way up here, and I was trying to uh, decide what to play. And I just, I was thinking, oh, you know, because I'm always looking for ways to incorporate things from the modern era into, into the jazz world. You know, I, I think back to you know, when you know, 50s and 60s, where you have Miles Davis and John Coltrane playing what we now have as standards. And a lot of those tunes were really pop songs of the day. You know, they were really Broadway tunes, which was popular music, you know, and everybody was covering those tunes. And so these days, it's a little harder to find stuff to, to incorporate into a jazz style, but I'm always on the lookout. <laughs> So I, I periodically will go and listen through uh, the top 40 playlists or top 100 global or whatever, um, or the top of the Billboard chart or something. And you know, it, you know, very often it'll be hard to find something that can really translate. But occasionally I'll find something. And Lewis Cole is not really a, a like a top 40 kind of a musician, but he's. Uh, He's kind of a rising star, I'd say. He's getting getting pretty popular. I wouldn't consider it jazz, but there's definitely jazz influence, a lot of jazz harmony, and uh, certain lines that he that he writes sound very jazz influenced. So, anyway, um, yeah, try to do something a little different. Uh, I just wanted to start by uh, asking if there are any questions that you guys have uh, planned to ask or anything that I can. I can start with. No questions? You know, one thing I'm always curious about, Phil, and, and you could, you know, th this may come into play later too, so feel free to answer as much as you, as you want. But, but I always think about like, like the different stages that we go through in our development mm -hmm. and kind of what practicing looks like in those different stages. Yeah. Because I feel like it, it kind of evolves depending on where you are and what you're working on. But, you know, I think especially thinking about, you know, us, all of us, you know, progressing from like just trying to learn our instrument to trying to learn different styles, whether it's jazz or other stuff, and then trying to really get proficient and then taking that to other levels. Like, are there, are there things that you found like in your journey from, you know, young musician to college student to now professional that were like really helpful for you in those different stages of your development? Yeah, in terms of your approach to practicing, that's that's a really great question, um, and I definitely have a lot that I can say about that. Um, I I think that it's really crucial for all musicians to have a period of time in their life where they are practicing multiple hours per day, um, because as life goes on, it tends to get more busy, um, as has been the case for me. Um, my really busy, my, my really uh, kind of woodshed years of, of my life were probably in high school and college, I'd say. Um, and then after, after I was done with grad school, um, it became a little harder to kind of still keep up the, the practice regimen. But there was a period of time where I was learning repertoire. I was learning maybe two tunes a week, memorizing them, and. I did that for a couple of years, um, and then I would go to jam sessions and I would play those tunes, play those tunes, 
Um, but you know, going back to high school, I started playing bass when I was about 11 years old, and I started studying seriously with two two teachers, um, a, a guy who was teaching me classical bass and uh, another guy who was teaching me jazz bass. And in those years, I developed a practice habit where I was practicing three to four hours a day um, in high school. And I, I, it got to the point where if I didn't do it, my day felt incomplete. And a lot of times it's hard to really get to that point. Because, you know, there's a whole science about creating a habit, you know, 21 days is supposed to be the magic number of, you know, if you do something for 21 days, you can, it's, it's, it's ingrained in you. Um, and just a, a really quick anecdote that I try to, uh, that I think can be applicable even as, as an adult. Uh, when I was about 14 or 15, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania, so I'm a, you can see I'm a Pittsburgh Pirates fan. Um, there was a watch, a Pittsburgh Pirates watch that I really wanted, and so my dad bought it for me. But he said that I had to practice for it. So I wasn't allowed to wear it, wasn't allowed to open it up. Uh, so I sat on my desk, I could look at it, and uh, I had to log my practice hours. And I don't remember if it was uh, an hour per dollar or half an hour per dollar, but it was, you know, it's anywhere from, I think the, the watch was like $75. So I had to practice anywhere from like 35 to 75 hours or something like that. A decent amount of time for a, a 14 or 15 year old. Uh, so I, you know, and he could hear me practicing. There was no way to, to cheat on that. Not that I wouldn't want to, but um, it, it took me probably a couple weeks to get that amount of time done. And by that time, I had earned the watch, but I had also gained um, the, the benefit, I, I saw the benefit of what I had been doing. You know, I had been practicing so consistently that I also started to notice myself getting better and improving. And I really liked that feeling because it made, it made it more fun to play. And it made things easier. You know, when I would go to school and I'd play in the, the jazz band or an orchestra or something, things would just come easier just because I was spending more time on the instrument. And so at that point, after I had earned that watch, I had kind of developed a habit. And so I kept that going and it was sort of a non-negotiable thing for me at, at one point where, you know, I, you know I, maybe I got done with my homework around midnight. I still hadn't practiced. I would, I would practice, you know, as late as I needed to. Or I would get up early and practice. Um, I kind of just didn't, I didn't make any excuses. The only exception would be maybe if I was traveling with family or something. But I would still bring along, like, my electric bass and try to play, play there. But, um, yeah, so several years in that period, and I was really working on a lot of foundational stuff, and I, I, I grew up with the Samandel method. Um, and I feel like, for me, that was a really critical part of my development. I, I worked on the Samandel method. Are, 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 there bass, are you guys bass players, or is it a, kind of a mix? You know, unfortunately, our orchestra rehearses during this time. Oh. So. <laughs> okay. But, but they'll be able to watch it. Oh yeah, online, for yeah. sure. Is, what, what instruments are represented here? Drums? Drums as well. Cool. Piano. Trombone. Cool. Saxophone. Okay. Bass. 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 Awesome. Bass. Sweet. Okay. What, what about? Saxophone. Saxophone. Okay, cool. Um, what about you back there? Saxophone. Saxophone. Okay, cool. So the Samandel method is a you know very, very classic bass method book and very foundational, very fundamental. Um, it was, it's the sort of thing where it, it, it's not always the most fun thing to practice, um, but it's because it's so foundational and so fundamental, um, it really helps you in the long run. So if you're willing to put in the discipline of time to work out of that method book, or any method book, it could be, you know, it's not, not like Samantha was the magic, the magic book, but um, I really liked it. And the thing that I've noticed from observing other musicians, musicians that I consider great. Um, one of my teachers in high school, or I'm sorry, in uh, graduate school was Ron Carter. And he was a big advocate of fundamentals. He, he made me practice uh, two exercises for about four weeks, and he wouldn't let me move past them before I had, before I had satisfied his uh, expectations. Uh, the first one was a one-octave F major scale, 
up and down. I had to do it a specific way. Um, I can demonstrate it for you really quickly. And it sounds very easy, but. The idea was to play it as quietly as possible with as good of a tone as possible. Um, exactly with the metronome, always at 92 beats per minute, with no variation in the, the, the time or the intonation or uh, string buzzing or anything like that. So for instance, you wouldn't want to go, you know, you don't want to have the notes louder or softer. They all had to be exactly the same. And on the bass, Every string reacts differently, you know, because there are different thicknesses, so you have to really approach each string differently. And each instrument has things like that, you know. You have to approach different drums or different, er, different areas of the keyboard a, a different way. You know, you can't treat the low end the same way as you do the high end. Um, it's, it's a constantly shifting approach. So for, the, for me, when I started doing that, I, was, I had just finished my undergrad. You know, and uh, it was a pretty humbling experience to be put in that situation. And, you know, Ron Carter is sitting, you know, about as far as that monitor is from me in his, in his apartment, smoking, on, smoking his pipe and just saying, oh, that note is flat. No, no that note was sharp. Uh, oh, that was not with the metronome. And he would make me start over each time. So I had to get 10 times through perfectly. And he wouldn't let me move on from that for about four weeks. Um, and it was... You know, and he expected me to practice several hours a day with that exercise. So I spent many hours in the practice room practicing that scale. And it was a good opportunity for me to, to exercise discipline. And over time, I started to notice a difference in my playing. And not only me, but my friends. Um, I'm sure you guys have had the experience where you're playing a, you know, a jam session or you're playing with, with friends in a combo or something. And, you know, your friends will say, oh, you sound so great, great to play with you. We hope, hope to play with you again sometime, you know, something really positive. But very rarely will they say, oh, you sound like you're getting better, you know, acknowledging that, like, you weren't as good before. And what was happening for me on a few gigs was, you know, guys that I, that I knew pretty well, uh, they usually would make positive comments, just like everybody. They started to say things like that. They said, man, what are you practicing? Your, your time is getting better and your, your sound is bigger. And I said, well, I'm working on this stuff with Ron, and uh, it, that, for me, that was like a, it, it, it clicked, you know, I was like, wow, this is really working, this type of thing, because that exercise, as mundane and simple as it sounds, was really forcing me to control the instrument better, because I realized that I didn't have as much control. You know, the first time I played it, you know, all the notes were different volumes, and, you know, there were string noises, and he'd always be like, no, play quieter, play quieter. <laughs> Uh, and I couldn't play quietly. I couldn't play quietly with good time. You know, I had like a couple things that I could do well. You know, um, I could play like a medium blues. You know, that was super comfortable for me. But I couldn't play. This exercise really forced me to approach each string and each, uh, each note differently. And there, there reached a point in my lessons with him where he said, he always called it all of his students, Mr. or Ms. Uh, so, you know, we called him Mr. Carter. He said, Mr. Keene, do you realize that, I've been, that I'm still working on this? And at that time, he was in his mid-70s. He's in his mid-80s now. Uh, and I was just like, what? Ryan Carter's working on this mundane scale exercise, and it was because he, ha he has this, this un unsatiable 
quench, or, uh, uh, quest for, for improving and getting better. And I've seen so many people like that, great masters of their instruments who just, they really prioritize the fundamentals. You know, whether it's, uh, you know, Kenny Washington is a great drummer who uh, gets up at, you know, 6 a.m. to practice his rudiments like every day. Hank Jones, a great jazz pianist who's no longer living, no matter where he was in the world, he would always get up early and, and practice. And then he would get to the venue, wherever it was, uh, three hours early and warm up. Always. It didn't matter if he got to the hotel at 4 a.m., he would get up a few hours later and, and practice. It was just like, and he worked with everybody. He was extremely successful. So for me, it's just, it's been a, it's interesting for me to observe that because a lot of students that I encountered, um, and it's a tendency for everybody, we want to get to the fun stuff, the faster, the, the, the solo-y, uh, flashy types of things. But what I've realized is that without the fundamentals, without those kind of mundane things, uh, like the Samandal book, going back to the Samandal, um, all of that other stuff is not going to sound as good. And so for me, one thing that I've done throughout my whole time as a musician um, that's kind of tied everything together is I've really tried to prioritize those fundamentals. And whether it's, you know, always having like a consistent warm up, or uh, for me, I, I, I kind of identified a few exam, a few uh, exercises for myself that always uh, help me to grow exponentially. There's a, a few base specific exercises that have always helped me. Um, that particular one is, is one, especially when I'm playing on a new bass. If I'm traveling and I'm not playing my own bass, that exercise really helps me to get to know the instrument better, you know, quickly. And I'm, I'm, each, each time, each repetition of the scale exercise, it forces me to, to make adjustments and then I'm able to, hopefully able to learn, learn the bass a little bit, learn that specific bass. Um, but for me, um, I don't have as much time to practice these days. Um, and so that's when I have to rely on those years when I practice many hours. Um, and I think that if you don't have that time at some point in your life, I'm not saying you necessarily have to do that for your whole entire life. Um, you know, and it, it was interesting over the holidays, uh, I guess it was not this past Christmas, but the Christmas before, uh, I went to visit Mr. Carter again uh, and introduced him to my wife, and uh, we had a nice visit with him and, and his wife. And he said something to me about like, you know, I know you, I know you're really busy. Uh, you would just make sure you get in like, you know, about an hour and a half. You know, just don't don't try to get you know a lot of hours. Just try to get like a solid hour and a half in. And that kind of caught me off guard because I was always thinking like, oh, I need to be practicing more. I need to be practicing all of these hours. Because that's what I used to do, and I don't have the time for that anymore. But when he said that, it kind of made it seem a little bit more manageable. So I think that practicing kind of diminishes over the years, you know, because of busyness and because of responsibilities and jobs and family and all, all, all sorts of things. And I remember being in college, my professors would say, you know, I would, I would complain about not having enough time to practice. It's like, you know, wait till, wait till you graduate, wait till you're out of here. You know, then, then you'll see the meaning of not having enough time. And I always thought, oh, yeah, yeah, but you really, you really don't know what my schedule's like, you know. That's kind of how I felt. But when I, got, when I graduated and I, you know, started moving on in life, I, I was like, wow, they were right. They were right. It's much harder to find time to practice now. So um, now is the time for, for, for you all to practice. You know, really make this, make it a priority to practice multiple hours a day, whatever, I mean, maybe you're required something specific for your lessons. Um, various teachers would require different things of you, but it was usually somewhere around three hours, three to four hours a day um, that was required. So if you can get that amount of time in every day consistently for several years, then you start to develop uh, really important skills that you can refer back to and, and kind of refresh more quickly later on. Um, for me, I, like I said, I don't have as much time to practice these days, but when I do practice, because I've had that period of, of practice time earlier, 
I'm able to learn things more quickly than I than I would have if I if I hadn't had that time. So, um, but I guess the one thing that ties it together for me is always prioritizing the fundamentals. You know, um, if I skip that, my I just become completely dissatisfied with my playing, and it really shows up in my intonation and my time and and everything. I think. You know, Ron Carter is the most recorded bass player of all, of all time, 2,000 albums, and he still practices his major scale. You know, at the, with the metronome, that's like a very beginning exercise, but he does it in a very specific way uh, because he wants to keep himself accountable for time and intonation and all of the basics of, of playing. So for me, that's, all, that's been a huge, huge thing that uh, ties everything together for me. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I'm just curious, Bill. Can yeah. I mention just some of the other bass exercises? Oh, for sure. I mean, you don't take a lot of time to go yeah, yeah. bass exercises, but it would be great for, you know, for Absolutely. Bass and others who will check it out. Yeah. Um, well, there's another exercise that uh, I refer back to all the time, which is, I'm sure you've heard of the vomit exercise, uh, Gary Carr. It's a, uh, yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have my bow to demonstrate it, but it's a, it's a really great intonation exercise. And for me, whenever I notice intonation slipping, it's like, oh, time to go back to the vomit exercise. And that was something that, you know, during my high school years, I practiced that every day. And it was like, if I didn't practice, I felt incomplete. <laughs> my day is not complete if I don't do that. Um, another exercise that I learned from uh, Ben Wolf, who was one of my teachers in college, was this arpeggio exercise which I haven't played for a little while, but I can demonstrate it for you. Um, it's basically, it, go, it starts on, on in C major, and it go, basically goes from the lowest note uh, on the bass. Whatever, that, whatever the lowest note of that particular key is, that's where you start it. So in C major, the lowest note is an E. So you play a C arpeggio, and then you play a, a D arpeggio down, and then you play an E arpeggio up, and an F sharp arpeggio down. And you're always ending on whatever the lowest note is in that particular arpeggio. It sounds kind of confusing. Um, I can, maybe I can send you a PDF of it if you want to yeah. pass it around. Yeah. But uh, for me, that's also something that I practice when I'm learning a new instrument, uh, if I'm traveling or something. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to demonstrate it right now. practice it at multiple tempos. Um, when I was practicing that very regularly, I would practice it slowly, and I would also practice it, you know, etc. you know. Um, and 
so that's also a good one for just agility and getting getting around the instrument. And some of those shifts are really challenging to do, especially fast. So one thing I would do, there's a lot of like for bass players, there's a lot of forward thumb shifts. You know, like F to B flat. So I would spend a lot of time just going. Each time trying to trying to improve it, and then another one in in the exercise is F sharp to B. You know, and then you can do it slower, obviously, and gradually speed up the tempo. But it really forces you to kind of work out the logistics of that. Um, and for me, that's been a hugely helpful exercise. So I would say that one and the arpeggio exercise, uh, the vomit exercise, and the Ron Carter F major scale. There's another one that I've also found to be helpful, which I need the metronome for. Um, so I'll pull out my handy phone here, and my metronome. This is an exercise from Christian McBride, and I'll just explain it briefly. You take the 12 bar blues, F to F blues, um, and you start by, you start at a tempo of 40, and you play, you start by playing one note per click, and then you play, after one chorus of that, you do two notes per click, and then you do three notes per click, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, and then eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So um, by the time you get up to eight, you're playing at about 320. So it's a, it's a great exercise for not only uh, working on time modulations, but also working on endurance for speed, you know? And a lot of people are not good at playing at 40 or 320, you know? And if, you're, if 320 is a little too fast, then you can start at 39 or 38, you know? And then the tempo is gonna be a little, a little slower at the, at the top. So um, I'll demonstrate that for you.
an important key for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I think I added a measure in the three section, but at any rate, an important key to that is not looking at the metronome. That's why I was closing my eyes and not looking down at the floor. Because if you use your eyes to look at the metronome, you're kind of missing out on some of the, the you know, the important ear training aspects of that exercise and subdividing and all the things that go into playing something like that. So for me, when I'm playing that exercise, a measure or two before the next modulation, I'm trying to hear that modulation, that, that next time over what I'm playing. And some of them are a little easier than others. Uh, right around the five, six, seven area, that's where it gets a little pretty hairy, especially on the way back down. I find the way back down quite a bit more challenging than going up. Um, but it's really great. It's really great for concentration. It's great for endurance. It's great for hearing multiple time uh, modulations, you know, in case a song has that type of thing. Like you see a meter change and it says, you know, quarter note equals dotted quarter note or something like that. You know, being able to, to think about that in, on the fly. This exercise is really great for that. Um, it's, it's just great for, for so many things. And I've, I've had, uh, I've assigned this exercise to drummers uh, because even though you're not playing the, the notes of the chord, you, you can still play time uh, and play all of the, you, you can play a 12 bar form, 12 bar blues form and hear the, hear the blues in your head um, and just play in those different metric modulations. Uh, so it's applicable to a lot of different, uh, a lot of different instruments as well. Um, that's, uh, it, speaking of Chris McBride, it's, it's kind of funny and uh, I, I, you know, these days without gigs, m without many gigs because of the pandemic, a lot of players who I consider to be the top of the top, it's, it's interesting to see how everyone has kind of been kind of even, like it's an even, play, even playing field for everybody because nobody has gigs. I mean, gig, some gigs are starting to open up in various parts of the world. But uh, I remember seeing a post by Christian McBride, um, and he, he played, it was like his first gig in the, during the pandemic for several months. And he was playing with Jeff Tane Watts, who is uh, one of my favorite drummers, but also he plays very loudly. And so Christian posted this picture of like this nasty blood blister on his fingers. <laughs> and I was just like, what? Christian McBride gets blisters? <laughs> but it was because of the pandemic. And so it was just like, wow, like everybody is dealing with this. You know, so I wanted to, you know, just if, you know, if any of you guys have any questions about the, about the pandemic or like how to, how to proceed with the pandemic, it's been something that I've definitely tried to, to wrap my head around. And I've seen a lot of people, you know, be really creative during this time. Um, it's very easy to get, to get down about everything that's, that's been happening and the loss of gigs. And, you know, it seems very bleak. But um, I've seen a lot of people that I admire just really using this time. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Dion, Tuck Dion Tucker, who plays with Harry Connick, um, he did a little Zoom masterclass uh, down at Snow, and he was talking about what he'd been doing during the quarantine. I didn't realize that right before the pandemic hit, he, had, he was playing with Jazz at Lincoln Center down in Brazil, and he said that he just started experiencing like really big problems in his in his embouchure and like night after night it just kept getting worse like ideally it would keep getting better but it was like he couldn't play and he, his range like was diminishing and diminishing so he finally went and saw an embouchure specialist and uh he had some type of a muscular disease uh or or, or disorder I don't, I don't remember what it was but he had to relearn his whole way of playing so during the pandemic he was he spent all of that time relearning how to play the trombone. Uh, and I had no idea before asking him to do that clinic. I was just, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Like in, in such a dark time as the pandemic, when you're dealing with like not being able to play your instrument, you're taking that time to relearn it. It was just, it just blew my mind. Um, and, and, there, and another friend of mine like built a jazz club in his house and like started to work on, learn how to record, like learn how to use recording equipment um, other people are doing live streams uh, from their from their apartments or their their house, um, and just being really creative. But 
uh, just that's kind of a, just a little tangent of, of Kristen McBride because of, I've always thought like, oh, Kristen McBride probably never gets blisters anymore because he, you know, his his hands are just massive and it's like he just plays it so, <laughs> so it looks like it's like no effort at all. Uh, but it was like, wow, you, you know, and I saw Bob Hurst. I saw a picture of him posting the same thing. It was like his first gig and he had a blood blister. I'm just like, man, it's it's nice to know that it's not just not just the little guys that this happens to, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, how have you guys been doing with, with the, the pandemic and dealing with that? Any of you had any, any problems with that or had done anything that you found useful? Yeah. I mean, I feel like things in Logan for us, it's not like we have a ton of gigs out here anyway, and we're uh -huh. playing a lot. Yeah. So I think more than anything, it's kind of just given us more time to practice. Cool. You know, that's awesome. Like Zoom classes. I have a practice pad next to me when I'm on those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's a great way to to approach this time, and I'm I'm happy to hear that because a lot of people uh, get down and they just be like, ah, oh, like when when are the gigs gonna come back? And I I, I realized something after uh, you know during the whole process of this, I you know I remembered that there was a a, a similar flu pandemic in the in. 1918 and there's like a telegram of like Louis Armstrong talking about this pandemic that like he's in the middle of and he's coming back from Europe and he's talking about all these all these musicians have this flu and you know they're they're trying to work despite all of that stuff and I just thought man that's crazy that like Louis Armstrong and the, and all of those musicians who started jazz like went through the same thing and then you think about like the 20s came after that they call it the Roaring Twenties. You know, everybody was just like bursting to get out and play music and hear music. And so all of the music that we that influences music today basically came after that pandemic. Like, I'm not all, but like a huge volume of music. Like, you think about all the decades that have come after that. So for me, it's encouraging to think about this time. You know, it, it seems bleak, but... Uh, I, I'm very optimistic about, about it, and I believe that it's, things are going to come around. They might, you know, it might be slightly different or, or very different, but I believe things are going to come back around. So for me, it, that gives me some hope, knowing that those guys, you know, our heroes of the music, dealt with a very similar thing. So, um, yeah. Yeah. We could probably look at the time for just a few more minutes here, but I, I was curious about if you could talk just briefly about um, tunes and learning tunes. Yeah. If you could just talk maybe like about like maybe like how you prioritize which ones to learn first, right? Because you're just getting started on learning tunes. Yeah. And then if, whether you have kind of a method for learning tunes. Absolutely. Yes. So there's two lists that I well I'll, I'll go back to the beginning, and I'll try to make it quick. Um, I learned, I started learning tunes when I was a teenager out of a real book. Um, and I realized along the way that the real book had a lot of mistakes in it. A lot of mistakes with keys and, and the melodies. And one reason why was because a lot of those charts were written based on instrumental versions. Um, and sometimes, you know, who, who knows really who wrote them? Um, but sometimes I would check out the, the, the recording that was listed at the bottom of the real book page and it would be like, this doesn't sound anything like the, like the melody, you know, and it would be like a different key. It's like, how did they, anyway. Uh, but but, but my, one of my first jazz teacher, um, Blaine Dolphin, he went through the, the index of the real book uh, when I was just starting it. He kind of put a, a, a little mark next to each tune that he felt like I should know. Uh, and they were all standards. And So the real book, I think for me, for me, is a positive way to practice like chart reading and sight reading. Um, but I like to learn tunes themselves from the recordings and from like maybe the original sheet music of like a Broadway, like condensed Broadway score. Uh, like if you're, if you're learning like a Jerome Kern tune or Irving Berlin, they have like these like song books that have just like a condensed, basically a condensed Broadway score of the, of the tune, you know, and it's got like the exact melody and the lyrics, so you get the accuracy of that. Um, but then I also pair it with a couple different recordings. I try to find like the, the original recording, if, it is, if, if, if it's played by the composer, preferably, or if it's whoever the composer wrote it for, 
you know. I try to find, I look that up, and there's a lot of stuff on Wikipedia you can find, uh, and, and other, other sites. Um, you gotta be careful with Wikipedia, of course, but uh, you can figure out if it's, if it's right or not after a while. Uh, but I try to go to the earliest possible recording, um, or find like a really quality piece of sheet music about it. And then I like to listen to a couple different vocal versions of it, you know, by notable jazz singers. I learned a lot of stuff from Frank Sinatra, um, Ella Fitzgerald, you know, and you start to kind of notice which singers seem to kind of sing it uh, more straight rather than a lot of taking a lot of liberties with it. But the value of learning a vocal version is that you you get the lyrical accuracy, the lyrical rhythmic accuracy. Whereas if you're learning the way Miles played it or Coltrane, that's also amazing, but they took a lot more liberties with the way that they played the melodies. So I like to do a little of both, and it sounds like a lot of steps to go through, but I feel like to really learn the tune fully, you kind of have to go to that extent. Um, so that's how, that's how I kind of like to approach it, is trying to find the earliest possible version of it, recording and possibly sheet music, although I'm pretty big on learning it by ear, um, and then find a notable version, vocal version, and then a notable instrumental version, kind of a bunch of different ones, and, compare them together, uh, and then play it with people, you know, see what other people have checked out. Like, maybe somebody checked out a version that I hadn't heard of or didn't know about. Um, that always helps me to improve. Um, but so, the, you know, the Real Book Index is a good source of where to fine tune it. But there's a couple lists online. Um, there's this blog, I can't remember who, who writes the blog, but it's called thewoodshed.com. It's just like a, somebody's blog, and he has a list of like 300 standards. And if you read through it, you know, they're all standards. They're all important songs to know. And he kind of categorizes it in his opinion of which tunes are critical to know, and then I think high, medium, and low. Um, and it, of course, it's his opinion, but it's also a good starting point. You know, I like to recommend for my students to just go through that list and pick tunes that you don't know you know, and make your own personal list. There's also a much shorter list made by Ray Drummond. And if you search for uh, Ray Drummond's core 50 tunes that every jazz musician should know, if you just Ray Drummond core 50 tunes, you'll find this list. It's, it's on a bunch of different sites, um, but it's, it's a much smaller list. It's just 50 tunes. Uh, so I, pick, I try to pick tunes from those lists. Um, a way that I learn the tunes as a bass player, um, let me just pick a tune to demonstrate kind of how I, this is, this is the way that I learned tunes when I mentioned how I was learning two tunes a week uh, for three years. That was for my private lessons. Um, and I'll, I'll do the first tune that I, that I played this way, uh, which was Pirate Blackbird. Um, and then if I have a minute, I'll explain how I did it wrong the very first time. But basically, as a bass player, I play the tune, this is, and this is really coming out of the Ray Brown method of learning, you play the bass line in two, just, just half notes, so no extra notes. Uh, you play the chords and then you sing the melody. So, um, I'll try to do my best to sing.
the tune about three choruses worth. Uh, with some of my students, I like to add an extra chorus there of playing a soul, just improvising over the changes. Um, but that's not part of the original Ray Brown method. Uh, but for me, when I first started doing that, I had never done anything like that. Singing and playing <laughs> so hard. Um, and I just like, I butchered it. And I also, when I used to play this tune, I used to always put like a, a, a C pedal a a, on the five chord, just a pedal at the beginning. <laughs> just kind of pedaling on the five for a while, and then at a certain point you go to the, the regular changes. Um, and I did that for my, for my, when I brought this tune in for the lesson, and, and I didn't know I was not supposed to do that, and he was, he, he was very unhappy that I did that. <laughs> so I, it was, you know, it took several weeks to really kind of get the flow of that. And obviously that's kind of a very bass specific thing, but I, I think it can also be applied to other instruments. Um, for, you know, for drummers, you can, you can play the ride cymbal and sing the melody, or play just time and sing. Uh, for any other instrument, you know, maybe sit down at the piano and play the bass line with your left hand and sing the melody. Um, and then you pick up your horn and, and walk a bass line over the changes, you know. If you've never done that before, I would, I would highly recommend it. Uh, learning bass lines for non-bassists, I think, Helps you, to, helps you to hear the bass when you're playing in a group. Um, it also helps you to hear the logical movement of the changes. Uh, if, you know, hopefully, if you're listening to a good bassist, you know, one of, the, one of the masters, you'll hear like a very strong voice leading from chord to chord, and you'll you kind of learn how to hear that. Uh, it also helps you to learn how to uh, internalize the changes more. So there's ways you can adapt it for different instruments. Um, but it, it really puts you out of your comfort zone to do, to do it that way, uh, singing and playing. But it, it also uh, kind of forces you to focus more. And that's the important part, is focusing. Because when you're playing in a group, you have to be focusing all the time. And it's so easy to zone out with so many distractions that we have. And, uh, the more we can just focus, the, the better the playing situation will be. So that's kind of how I go about it. Oh, thank yeah. you. At, at that, we have run out of time, I have to say. Uh, thank you very much, Phil, and we yep. look forward to playing with you tonight. Yeah, likewise. Thank you all. Yeah.